You guys, I am joined by the one and only Frenchie. Frenchie, welcome to the Volume Up Podcast. How's it going? Hi. Hey, everybody. Thanks for the invite. I truly, truly feel honored for this moment. <laughs> well, we are honored to have you with us. Uh, Frenchie, for those who are unfamiliar, let's start at the beginning. Tell us yeah. about how you got to the beauty industry. Did you always know that you were going to be a hairstylist? Oh, interesting. So I kind of got an early start in the beauty industry, meaning in high school, it was the trade program was offered then. So that's mm -hmm. when I actually decided to join in. I say my sophomore year, so it was a three year program. Mm -hmm. So by the time I graduated, I was uh, I completed the test, um, graduated and got my license. Um, but it wasn't my first choice in my career. It was more of a backup plan before okay. I decided to get started. So I say high school was when I was really first introduced. What did you think you would do? What was the, this was the backup to what? Oh, so my original dream career girl, I was going to become a veterinarian. So uh -huh. that was my, yeah, I was, I'm still an animal lover. That's my passion uh -huh. on the side, but that's like my little secret hobby. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm like a dog whisperer. I do claim that. But um, yeah, I had a vision of becoming this wonderful veterinarian and just pursuing goals and stuff like that. And maybe mm -hmm. working in a zoology field, but you know, things happen. I had a change of heart. And once mm -hmm. I got more into um, being a hairstylist, because I would still go back home for the weekends, holidays. I had a nice little clientele built up. Uh -huh. I used to work in, um, not sure if you ever remember Regis Incorporated. It was another mm -hmm. franchise. So yep. that's where I basically started out working in there back in Fulton School. Um, I stayed in, I stayed in the agriculture department and you know, graduated with a BS in plant science, horticulture. Mm -hmm. But again, I wanted to pursue more of my dreams in the hair industry because I started getting more into my um, creativity, uh, working behind the scene. I was interested mm -hmm. in working with a brand. So I leaned more onto that once I graduated. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you're starting in a franchise, working out of Regis. Um, how mm -hmm. did you get exposed to all that the industry has to offer? Because you've done a lot and we're going to get into yeah. that. Um, yes. you've, you've really had your hands in everything. Um, but like when you were starting, did you know mm -hmm. that that was going to be available to you? I didn't know right away. I knew I had to earn my keep, basically. You know, I had mm -hmm. to work my way up to certain level just to get in the, that type of level I was looking for. Because like mm -hmm. I said, I was introduced to hair at an early start in high school. Um, and my first hair show was in high school. So mm -hmm. by that being said, it kind of gave me, you know, it opened up that option like, oh, this is where it can take me. So once I graduated, you know, high school, I decided still to continue my college endeavors, but I still had in the back of my mind, like, it's something about this industry that's really gravitating to me. I love mm -hmm. making people feel good about themselves and the creativity that was involved in it, the knowledge, you know, it was just a lot. So it just brought me more into it. And I just wanted to try to capture those moments, those opportunities when they came. Uh, and you've definitely made a career out of doing exactly that, which again, we're yes. going to get into. Um, <laughs> the first thing, though, that I want to talk about is French Maid. So how did this happen? How did you decide you were going to go do it? Like, talk to us about it. Well, so that's this actually French Maid is my second name, my second brand name. I went by, I used to go by Unique Styles by Frenchie. Okay. <laughs> So that being said, I was working in another salon at the time, maybe I think it was around 2000. Between 2013 15, I was going through like not an identity crisis, but I'm trying to figure myself as a name brand for my my business. Uh -huh. And I knew Unique Styles by Frenchie was just kind of too common. And, you know, it just clicked in my head one day, French made. And I was like, oh, so I just started thinking about it. And instead of spelling it like French made, mm -hmm. I was like, wait a minute, I can put my name, Frenchie, take the IE off, made, because I'm making people feel beautiful about themselves. So yep. that's kind of how I got the name French made and it came about that way. I love it. Uh, and super fun. Why? I mean, like in terms of branding, like you definitely remember that one, which is yes, half the exactly. battle. Uh, so bridal styling. Mm -hmm. Yes. How really did this hard. happen? I mean, you would, you've done a lot. You've done yes. editorial, you've done TV, move, like bridal styling is a beast and I want to get into it. Um, it is not for the faint of heart. Uh, it's a hustle. Uh, oh. So how did this happen? How, like, talk to us about like maybe your first bridal client. Like, what was that okay. conversation like? Well, you know, that kind of just, like I said, I've always was into hair, and I could say I might be related back to when I started doing my own hair. So mm -hmm. back when I was styling my hair in high school, I used to have these magazines. They used to be like Word Up magazines or hair styling Black Beauty magazines, mm -hmm. and they used to have like directions on how to style your hair, and they used to have 
pretty nice, pretty pin curl updos, the, the style that was back in that time. And I would sit in the mirror for four hours, literally four hours, creating the same look just reading the directions. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where my love of being creative, how to style and be artistic with hairstyling. That's when I noticed I was, I had a little, you know, bug for that. And then just out the blue, you know, clients, my regular clientele, they had special occasions that asked me to create an upstyle for them. So I kind of just guess basically naturally got into it on my own. So Mm -hmm. I eventually decided to work for a bridal um, company. And once I started working with them, I just realized, hey, maybe this is something I might want to start sticking with, you know, get more into it. And the bridal world is just, this is a whole nother industry in its own. <laughs> sure is. Um, all right. So talk to us about when you're consulting with a bride um, and she's interested in you working with her plus the party. Mm-hmm. What, what are you talking through? Like, what are the things that you have to have in place um, mm-hmm. in order to make this successful, because there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Mm, you want to no. respect the bride's vision, I'm sure, yes, but like yes. you are the actual stylist and you know exactly. what's going to have to happen in order for this to be. So yes. talk to us about that. I, I'm fascinated already. Right. Thank you. So you're absolutely right. There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen when it comes to bridal styling, but you have to, as being a bridal style, you have to be focused on the bride herself and mm. listen to what she wants, because at the end of the day, it's about her. It's not about everybody else. You mm-hmm. know, you can try to please everybody. You can't please them all. <laughs> but we're going to please these brides. That's what you want to do. So you yep. listen to what vision they're coming with you with. Um, let them know, you know, let them know that's what you're there to cater to. They will let them, let you know about their bridal party, but let them know specifically your services are more, you know, directed to her. And you'll mm-hmm. get the bridal party up to par, but, you know, the talent is really where she's at. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of that talent, the bride, um, when mm-hmm. you're doing your consultation with her, um, if she's got a vision for something mm-hmm. and you know that this is not going to come together, like mm-hmm. what, is, what does that look like? Is it always the, the customer's right? Or is it a situation mm-hmm. where like you've no, got to no. say it's not on the cards? Like talk yeah, to us you, about that. You want to be honest with yourself, yourself and the bride. If you know a certain look is not really becoming for her, then be honest about that because they're mm. that's what you're there for. You're providing mm-hmm. service and information and the vision to capture for them. So you want to make sure that you understand the shape of the um, bride's facial features, what they're going to mm. wear, if that look actually accommodates, because they will you will run into that type of situation. So I pre- I pre- prefer to see the whole look. I want to sure. know what your the colors are. I want to know what your dress looks like. If you're going to change your dress, I mm-hmm. want to know if what time of the wedding is it going to be early wedding, night wedding? Because that mm-hmm. you know everything makes a big difference. You want to know like how long the ceremony might be, how long the banquet. So mm-hmm. these things are key factors in knowing what type of hairstyle will accommodate that bride. And you got to understand their hair texture if mm-hmm. that texture can pull it off, or mm-hmm. if you can pull that texture off. So. Being versatile as a stylist is key. I'm telling you, especially in bridal styling, definitely. Mm. Frenchie, I got to ask. Um, on the podcast, we talked about a hairstylist who worked with a bride. Um, and in order to execute a style that the bride wanted, she wound up gluing the client's ears to her head. Would <laughs> you, in your, <laughs> would you go that far? Or is this something that you would just be like, look, this look doesn't work for, for you and we're not going to go there. I'd love to hear your take on that. I just want to make sure I heard what I heard correctly. You, you heard me correctly. She glued the client's ears to the side of her head in order to accommodate the hairstyle that she was going with. <laughs> okay, so now you just gave me an idea what type of clause to add in my uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> contract. <laughs> I am not a plastic surgeon or any type of. <laughs> That's the pull quote. That's cosmetic. the pull quote right there. Yep. <laughs> if if it don't fly, I can't. No, we're not going to realter your body to create a style. If it's if if I have to do that, if it's something where I can't realter your hair itself, then mm-hmm. it's not for you. It's, not it's just you. not for you. And again, that's you. where the stylists have to become honest mm-hmm. with themselves and be like, hey. I'm gonna be. We're not I'm going trying there. to. Yeah, we're not going to. Woo! That was. I, would I know. It's a doozy. On that wedding party. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, pictures are forever, but you know, the glue, <laughs> that the paint. I, you know. Anyway. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Thank you for mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, we try. We try. What's your favorite part about doing bridal styling? Um, like, um, I'm just because you've honored. done a few. Yeah, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of mm-hmm. of course. 
the after part, you know, if I can stay for the whole service. Sure. You <laughs> That's know, always perks. The icing on cake. Right, the perks. <laughs> but to me, it's just being able to be there for them, just creating mm-hmm. this vision, uh, you know, bringing their whole bridal bridal vision to life. It's like you you creating something, a memory. You know, it mm-hmm. lasts forever. Those pictures last Those forever. Pi- I was going to say, so, yep, yep. <laughs> So the look better be right. Line and you see one here, I'm like, ah, I'm cringing. So you just better make sure that they're picture ready and on mm. point. So yeah, that's my 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 takeaway from it is basically just being in the moment with them and creating mm. these looks. What is in your kit to get that photo ready hair? That's what I want to know. So like you, Ooh. like a, a normal day, you're like mm-hmm. rolling up with what? Well, that's a lot to be honest. Uh-huh. Oh, I, I know. Say. That's why I want to get into it. Like this is yeah, so cool. Yeah, that's that's like you about to have me pull out all kinds yep, of yep, mother yep. tricks. Because the thing is, you can't just have one product or one tool. So mm-hmm. again, I'm very versatile with my hair texture knowledge and understanding what type of textures I'm working with. So I bring yep. the whole salon with me, <laughs> mm. pretty much. When I unpack, everybody's looking like, "Whoa, you have a lot." I'm like, "Yes, yes." I don't know who's about to sit in my seat. It's, I might know the bride, but I don't know her party. So mm-hmm. it's like, you have to really make sure you have the right tool, whether it's the right curling irons, flat irons, whether it's the right comb, right tail comb, uh, uh, um, uh, right tail comb and a teasing comb, teasing brushes, round brushes. It's a lot. Then it goes mm-hmm. down to your products. Mm-hmm. So the products can go, it could go from like your curly hair to just your straight blowout hair. If you're doing extensions, you know, if you're doing braids or if you, even down to men, the men are mm-hmm. getting into the groomings now for brides. Oh, for sure. So, yeah, definitely want to be prepared. You just have to be prepared. That's what mm. you're, you're bringing the service to them. So if you don't have everything that you need to provide these services, then your professionalism is going down from right there. Jump. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of professionalism, um, I know that you're prepared for these gigs. Like you're talking about bringing in a whole bunch of stuff. Yes. Um, there's a lot that happens behind the scenes, though. That's not the physical equipment. Uh, so in mm. terms of like making sure that your business is right, let's talk a little uh-huh. bit about that. Um, if someone out there, one of our listeners is thinking like, they want to make this happen for themselves. They want to start their own business. They want to, you know, maybe purchase a salon or start one. What's the first thing in your perspective that they should do to make sure they're on the up and up they're legit. Well, first of all, when you get into a certain career, when you're choosing one, you want to do your research, make sure the career is right for you. Mm -hmm. It might look, if you see all the glitz and glam, but there's some, like you said, there's some serious things behind the the behind the scene that people don't understand or might not have been educated on. Mm-hmm. So do your research, find out what it takes to become that that professional, become certified. That's very important. Certifications, licensing is very important because that's what separates you from the rest. It might yep. not be from the best, but that's what separates your professionalism from the rest of you know the world. So <laughs> and, and it's like you want to people to take you on seriously, especially if you're mm-hmm. really into hair care and hair education, product knowledge, you know, you want to understand the product knowledge so you know what products to use for certain textures. So do your research, also figure out what, what your state, whatever state you live in, figure out the regulations, what's the requirements to becoming for that type of um, profession. You know, do your research on how much it costs for you to rent out booths because it's it's a big difference in being a a salon Mm -hmm. and owning a booth, a suite. So I've seen people come in and out. So you just got to be careful with that. For sure. Research, research, research. (laughs) And education. That's another. (laughs) Stay educated. (laughs) Stay educated. Um, Are there any resources that you'd recommend? Um, Obviously, yourself, you're a resource to people if they're interested. I'm sure they (laughs) could send you a DM. Um, But is there like any people out there that you look to for like business advice that you might want to amplify or signal boost? Um, I, it's been a while, so may she rest in peace. But my um cosmetology teacher from high school, she was always my go-to. Ah. Like she was like my mentor, Miss Holland. May she rest in peace. But anytime I had an issue, I used to go straight to her and ask for ah. advice. And she just puts you in the right direction. She gets you right on track, and like this mm. is for you. So I'm I'm very honored to have her like as a teacher for me. And ah. as business wise, I always gravitate to other influential people in the industry mm-hmm. that I work with. So I might ask some business tips here and there. And mm-hmm. also, your clients become your number one resource as well. Sure. Oh my goodness. It's, you'll be surprised how much your clientele will link you to the right path of what you're doing. Mm. 
you know, <laughs> barter systems. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and you're right. I mean, like it's a two way street so often, like you're spending so much time with these people and making those connections. And like, if you can help them and they can help you, you know, we love it. Um, And I love that you mentioned mentorship. We've talked so much on our podcast about the importance of mentorship, cultivating that relationship between mentor and mentee. Um, So wonderful to hear that you have that experience. Um, We know that it make or break a stylist. It does. It will. Yeah. Um, What are some things, some hiccups that you ran into when you were like first trying to get your business off of the ground um, Mm -hmm. that you might want to share with folks? Um, I would say hiccups I ran into, I would say would be in the marketing um, Mm -hmm. aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Because even though it's it's even more complicated now. And back then you had to do more footwork, you know what I'm saying? So if you wasn't really good with yourself back then, you had to really put yourself out there. You had to go out and pass those flyers out, put them on your cars, <laughs> go door to door, whatever you had to do, give yep. out these crazy deals, you know, because yep. people couldn't really physically see your work. But mm-hmm. now since marketing is so easy, it's just like right there in the palm of your hands. Yep. You know, it's kind of, it make it a little bit more easy. It's another job. Don't give me, that's another topic. But that is, <laughs> and we talk about that on this podcast a lot. That is a full-time yeah. gig and that's all the power to everybody gig. out there, all of the pros who are trying to make this happen. It's like, it'll themselves. make or break you, but it's, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing, but it's yeah. really good overall as far as having a, for a live portfolio on hand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you think that cosmetology schools should do a better job of helping people that are coming up to to learn about how to market themselves? Ooh, now let's that's a whole nother topic in self cosmetology schools. Now it, we we need some big improvement <laughs> in a lot of in a lot of areas. But let's we talk need about that. Some we got time for yep. right? Yep. <laughs> but yes, they should focus a lot on the marketing as well because it's important. Like, what did somebody tell me? It's like a few years ago. I don't know if it's still right. The estimate. Um, the percentage, the percentile of people who graduate and actually become successful out of cosmetology school is only seven to ten percent. Yep. That's very low. Yeah. Yeah. We might see a lot going on, but mm-hmm. as far as having your lit, uh, having your business legit and you know running with no hiccups or anything, seven to ten, that's very small. So slim margins, not telling. good. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, all right. Last question for this section, I guess, is okay. like what. What could happen um, if you don't get all of, all of your paperwork in place, um, all of your licenses, all of the the stuff? Well, well you know that Uncle Sam, they call him. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> he might come and knock in sooner or later. Knock, knock. knock, so, knock. Yeah. It's like it's very important to have all your legal aspects, everything in order, because you don't want that. You know, you don't mm-hmm. want your business to become a failure. You don't want to end up stop doing something that you love. So just having yep. those things in order, make sure you, you know, go on the USDA, just look and see what's the requirements, the Board of Cosmetology, what's the requirements, the DLLR requirements, whatever requirements it is, do it. It's beneficial. Mm-hmm. It just helps you and helps you in the long run and keeps you yep. safe. Good advice. Mm-hmm. People might not know this, um, mm-hmm. but I connected with you via the Texture versus Race 2022 yeah. Summit in Baltimore, um, where I met your made your acquaintance. I'm my um, shirt, I have my yep. shirt on today. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so tell me how you got connected with the TVR Collaborative. Okay. Well, long story. I've met Pia in well over ten years now. Yeah, mm-hmm. we were working under another brand. That's how we got um, connected with each other. And I've mm-hmm. just always watched her flourish and just grow mm-hmm. within the industry. And I know she started, she actually started the color culture first and then yep. came along TVR. Yep. And I was just all, I'm already, I was already intrigued with the color culture, the knowledge and stuff that she brings to that, just phenomenal. But then when she brought up the texture versus race program, I was like, this is something, whoa, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Okay. And like I said, I've always wanted to work with another brand that helped represent it, the person, the type of stylist I am myself. Because mm-hmm. again, I'm big on education and being professional and understanding texture knowledge and stuff like that. So it's like, it just really ran up my alley. And again, I'm versatility with my hair, you know, mm-hmm. services. So it's like being a hairstylist, why only limit your skills with certain textures? That's just... Again, I hate to bring it up. That's just discrimination of hair. It is. No, and you shouldn't. We this is the place to talk about that. It is absolutely not right. I mean, like, let's let's be clear. Um that stylists are not working with all textures, don't have Mm -hmm. knowledge, don't have interest, is hugely Mm -hmm. problematic. Yeah. Huge problem. Um, and I'm glad you talked about it. So yeah, sorry. Not sorry to interrupt. No, no, it's good. Like, like I said, coming into this industry, you have to be acceptance of everyone. 
Because you mm-hmm. never know who's going to sit in your chair or what exactly. type of hair they're going to have. It don't matter what skin color, they could be as pale and have the tightest curl. Mm-hmm. They could be darker complexion and have the straightest, mm-hmm. you know, or waviest. Mm-hmm. It's just you never know, but you have to be willing to be open and ready to take on those challenges. Well, not really a challenge, but just take on that type of customer and mm-hmm. help them to get to whatever level that they're trying to achieve with that service you're mm-hmm. providing, you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. I love that. Um, so what was your experience of this summit that, that we just had in, in Baltimore a couple of months back? Oh, every time we have a summit, I'm just like always blown away. It's always a different vibe, but it escalates even higher because <laughs> the message is being put out. Mm-hmm. So it's like, but this time I feel like the message was received a little bit more and give back to us because the replies that we were getting from it, it was just, wow. So it's just really good to see that this message is really being heard and people mm-hmm. are really taking a stand like hey let's bridge this gap like hair is just a fabric you know mm-hmm. it shouldn't have it shouldn't matter who or what where they come from mm-hmm. if you're willing to style it cut it treat it whatever it shouldn't matter who it, who it comes from mm-hmm. you know it's hair and mm-hmm. it's a beautiful thing everyone it has is. It. <laughs> it is everybody has it and it is Every- beautiful i think yeah. that that's perfect i love that you brought that the fabric um, bit in. I yes. mean, the, the theme was fabric and community. Um, yes. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. Like we should all embrace those textures, work with mm-hmm. them. Yeah. You know, oh, all right. Yeah. We are going to get into our quick takes, Frenchie. These are the questions that we ask yes. of all of our guests. We don't want you to think about it for too long. So just like quick associations. Okay. What was the first ever product that you owned that you remember either getting for yourself per request or that you bought for yourself or you were like, I got to have this. Uh, I'm going to think off top. It was so long ago, but if for some reason, I feel like it was pink oil moisturizer. <laughs> okay. Pink oil because I like back then we didn't do the type of styles we're doing now, yeah. but I always wanted to make sure my hair was moisturized and had a nice little shine to it. So I, mm-hmm. I do recall keeping that bottle around. So, yeah, I feel like that might have been a, either a comb or brush, but if not a product, that was the product for me. <laughs> Poor memory. I feel you. Okay. Are you superstitious? And if so, about what? <laughs> you like superstitious, like walking in a room with black cat? I mean, it could like... be. That could, that could be your superstition. I don't know. I don't want to <laughs> well, lead I do, you. Well, <laughs> I try not to think of negative superstitious things. I do more positivity thinking. Like I do burn my sage and stuff like that. I say manifestations every morning. And, you know, I try to do superstitious things that'll bring something good back to me. Yeah. Mm. Mm. (laughs) I love that. Uh, We could all use a little bit more of that. I don't need to worry about crossing a black cat or whatever. No, no. Cats are friendly. (laughs) Cats are friendly. You're right. Um, Back to the animal thing. Friendship. Uh, Bring it all back. All right. Okay. Um, yes. Who would play you in a biopic of your life? Oh, let me think. That's a good question. There's so many beautiful women out there. Mm, if I would have to pick, it might seem kind of crazy, but I don't know why, but Jill Scott for some reason, because she's just a strong, beautiful Black woman. And mm-hmm. I feel like she takes certain key roles and just brings it out when she mm-hmm. when she gets the opportunity. And you see her, she does, it's, she kind of almost reminds me a little bit because she does so much. But, you know, it's like she stays humble at the same time with it. <laughs> so uh, I would I say, just, I would be I love that you picked her. She's such a tremendous actress. Yes. I mean, like, people may be more familiar with her as a singer because she's also yes. great at that. But yes. the only acting. But she does a lot of yeah. great things. She, so she really I'm, does. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a good one. I can see it. <laughs> okay. Thanks. What do you consider to be the ultimate comfort food? Mm. I'm, I'm I'm really big in Asian cuisine. Okay. I don't know why. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's always something for me easy to whip up for one. Mm-hmm. So, and it's, it's very comforting for me. Like I love um, pho. I'm a big fan of pho. Whenever I have like mm-hmm. a bad sick day, or I always mm-hmm. go get a bowl and I'm good. Or any type of uh, soup dish that comes from it or yeah, anything comforting with that. I just, and anything with rice. <laughs> mm, mm, I feel that. Um, I love that, actually. Um, we don't often get that, so, but it is super yeah, comforting. It is comforting. <laughs> okay, last question that we've got for you. Say that you're on a deserted island and you mm-hmm. can only bring three beauty products. Ooh. What are you bringing? Qual- I'm just going to qualify this. You don't have to worry about water, sunblock. Nope. Like, the, we, we're good. I'm good. Nothing, okay, nothing I'm bad is going to happen to you. 
It's I just already like, know. Okay, great. Let's go. I already know because I don't need much. I have a lot of hair, mm -hmm. but again, <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm simple type. I don't have to use a lot to do what I need to do. Mm. And I'm very creative. So I'm sure Mother Nature will help bring my nutrients and whatever I need to provide to keep my hair sure. cleansed and healthy and manageable. Mm -hmm. But just mm -hmm. give me a comb, brush, and a scrunchie. Something to tie my hair up with. That's it. Wow. Comb and brush, scrunchie. That's it. Easy. Frenchy. Easy. I'm wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Well, this was a pleasure. Um, let's make sure that you plug. So where can people find Frenchie online, on social? Well, online, actually, my website is www.frenchmade.com, but you can also see and visit my page on Instagram, which is www.instagramfrenchmade. Okay. Boom. Yep. Yep. <laughs> easy. And this is easy. all going to be in the show notes. So don't you worry. We're going to make it nice and easy for people to find mm -hmm. you. Frank, Frenchie, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming oh, on the podcast. We really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Like I said, I'm honored to be on the podcast. This is my actual first podcast. So thank you, guys. You killed it. <laughs> ah, cool. Thank All right. you. <laughs>